few handouts right here, which uh, you can uh, pick up if you don't have the booklet. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you to the Drama Institute and Penastrack USA uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that's dear to my heart and uh, that I'm an advocate for. And to thank all of you for being here today uh, to hear what we have to share, because if you're not here, <laughs> then we can share. <laughs> um, women are half the sky in the world. And in Africa, the statistics show that we are more than 50% of the population. Uh, however, when you examine how many the statistics on women in STEM, especially at the terminal degree like myself, you find that we are less than 1%, which means we have an emergency uh, if we are to bring the 50% from the population into STEM fields so that they can be adequately represented, especially in an area where the jobs are there and which are some of the highest paying jobs in the world. And even when you go to who's making the policies, you find out that it is even the underrepresentation is even more critical, less than 1%. Now, some of the issues that relate to this uh, statistics is the limited access for primary and secondary education. And in some African countries, this is a result of socioeconomic norms, tradition, religious beliefs, family choices related to poverty and uh, issues of gender. Uh, the second reason is social conditioning of girls out of STEM fields through the educational system itself. Uh, third reason is limited opportunities of programs that nurture and groom women to be STEM, uh, to go into STEM careers, and even to get uh, doctoral degrees to go forth with their scholarship and things like that. Right now, I myself am facing a particular issue where I'm having to educate my senior administrator on some of the issues that relate to women's success in STEM. And the fourth is inequitable and hostile work environments. I just want to focus on the second issue, uh, which relates to building capacity, how we can, rather than social condition a girls out of STEM, bring them into STEM, and do so in ways that will help them to understand some of the issues that they will have to face to be successful. And uh, also related to their cultural heritage. And I just want to talk about two quick activities uh, that I do both in the classroom and that I have done with students at enrichment centers in summer camps and so on uh, where, with either some of the organizations I work with, the AAUW, American Association of University Women, uh, black Women for Black Girls, who has released a very important uh, report about what is important uh, to, for black girls to be successful in any career, and uh, what I have done also with a few schools back home in Africa. And the two activities I want to talk about is Okwe, which is popularly known as Mankala, and that is a game that's played all around Africa and in a lot of places in the world um, that relates to different uh, cultures and so on and so forth that is highly strategic, same caliber as chess, and that could teach a lot of mathematical things and a lot of things in other ways. Uh, what do I do in the classroom? I'm bringing creativity, the arts, and knowledge of culture, history, geography. Uh, when we talk about how this game got transmitted into the world, it, you look at three issues, slave trade, commerce, 
because it started as a record-keeping tool, uh, so it can be considered as the world's first computer. And the third way, of course, is Islamic religion. Uh, but when you look at a traditional Okwe board, wherever it is in the world, and I choose to use Okwe as the name rather than Mankala because that's the name that derives from my own ethnicity, my own heritage. It's called different things in different places in the world where it's played. When you look at the game board itself, it is always decorated. And the decorations have different types of patterns. And when we talk of mathematics, mathematics is the science of patterns. So when you look at anything, you try to understand the patterns that are there. So getting students to decorate their game board uh, using different types of patterns that will relate to some of the concepts that you're teaching in the classroom will help to uh, help to reinforce their knowledge there and get them excited. This is one where a student decorated it using patterns from the Pascal's Triangle. But some of the things that I have also done is to help relate to the lives of women for students to tell stories is that sometimes they have to decorate their game board to tell a story about the life of an African woman in mathematics. And that forces them to learn about issues of represent, uh, representation, some of the problems that, or challenges that women have to face to get there because they have to choose a woman who inspires them and their game board has to say certain things about the life of the woman. Or they could, in the woman's biography, you can find Vardis Edge graphs. In anybody's biography, they are Burnett's edge graphs from parts to cycles to wills. And this is one where uh, somebody found a path in this uh, professional woman in mathematics in her life. And this is a path of her education. And uh, just this is just a sample of an activity that is done with the Oakway, where the students have to learn about decision making and draw a decision-making tree diagram, which is also a Vardex edge graph for winning the game and so on and so forth. So there are so many things you can use the game to do, including creativity, and that brings in entrepreneurship because students don't have to create their game board out of egg cartons. They can really uh, uh, get excited and create game boards out of absolutely anything. And that brings in the issue of economic resources, because when you talk of schools that may not have economic resources that want to teach certain things, all they have to do is look around them for things that they can find in their environment that can teach exactly those same concepts, something that I didn't have the joy of happening to me when I was in high school or whatever, when I was learning mathematics concepts. Um, no one ever really brought an Okwe board to the classroom to teach me arithmetic, which it can, to teach me multiplication and so on and so forth. And with Okwe itself, you don't even need resources because you can use the ground to create your holes and stones to create your holes. Um, these dolls were actually created by students in my class. The second activity I do is the doll activity. Basically, dolls you can find all over Africa. Um, and it's not really a doll. This is to start to teach children about robotics because you are actually designing something that you, and when I teach it to the boys, they don't call it dolls. They call it their Star Wars <laughs> characters. But this is based on the Ndebele people. If you examine their culture, they are very symbolic, mathematical. Uh, patterns, numbers, and graphs exist everywhere in their life. So my students get to create Ndebele dolls, which you can create out of recycled materials. Excuse me. The, these were created out of water bottles. And now you can talk about physics, chemistry, you can even talk about uh, biology. Where does the physics come in? The force. You have to give your doll weight. 
where does the chemistry or come in in terms of what you use to stuff the doll whether you your doll will live long or it will die early depends on what you use to to stuff the doll or whether the doll will be fat or it will be thin depends on the on on, on the type of body you give the doll but basically my, my issue in this is not even teaching them dolls, it's about teaching them Vardex edge graphs and so on and patterns and numbers. So of course they have to decorate their doll to reflect some of the Vardex edge graphs they learn in the discrete mathematics classroom. Um, they have to relate their doll to the life of some woman in mathematics because I'm trying to also teach them about underrepresentation because some of them may be policy makers tomorrow and may be the ones to be able to change policies, both men, like I was telling somebody that I was glad that there are men here too, because we need our men as well uh, to be able to create enabling environments for women uh, and girls to thrive in STEM. Uh, so that's where I will end. I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> but, but like I said, in fact, these are not the best creations because students who create very nice ones take it away. <laughs> they only leave the ones that they don't like with me. Uh, but this, like I said, brings in entrepreneurship because a student who may get the joy of creating dolls can now actually begin a doll making business or something. And so you now have avenues to which you can uh, uh, use their innovation and creative ideas for them to become um, uh, entrepreneurs. You can become an entrepreneur as early as six years old. You don't have to be old, old aged to be one. No. So if you want to contact me, I have a few of my cards there. Thank you. So Inkechi and I actually had a program oh, together yeah. because I, uh, my background is in electrical engineering and I do software design right now. And she had a program with some young girls. And so we came in together to work for them to see somebody who does science and for her. And I was learning about the dolls myself for the first time. I'm like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And she's right, because she had different kind of bottles. And we could, you know, we could choose that. <laughs> and then, you know, the girls learning how to put the, you could use stone versus water and the science of it, and the engineering of it, of thinking if I put stones, what happens? And if I don't put enough amount, will they tip and fall? Versus if I put enough water, limited amount of water. It was, as an engineer, it was amazing. It was like, wow, different way to teach something. Well, I will say this. If you take even the curriculum that we have now, there are examples that are used in the classroom. It's just that those exemplars uh, may not be multicultural and may not reach a wide variety of the students. So it's a question of having something that's more diverse, um, that will be able to reach all groups of students. You know, I'm not suggesting trading one for the other. I'm suggesting bringing in the areas that are silent uh, right now. Because it is even important also for students who are not of color to learn about cultural things uh, in terms of promoting sensitivity uh, and promoting exchange. Um, like uh, Linda said, she has two Two, uh, a brother uh, and a sister. Uh, two relatives that would like to do mm -hmm. something. To volunteer. To volunteer. Uh, and if, if you're going to some place you haven't gone before, it's important that you get a sense of connect. Mm -hmm. And if you've had some of that connection through what happened in the classroom or what have you, you're in a better position when you get there to connect better. <laughs>